We've been talking about encountering God. And there are moments in our lives where God may sovereignly, without your permission, encounter you. God is able to encounter us. And you can find that in life. You can find that in Scripture. When Jacob was going from uh, where he was with his mom and dad, running away, going to Pat and Aram, and found himself in Mangaweka. <laughs> and uh, the only thing he could find for a pillow was a rock. And he put his head on the rock. And in the middle of the night, God encountered him. He saw a ladder that reached from earth to heaven and angels were ascending and descending. And God spoke to him and gave him direction for his life. And then he promised God that if you will watch over me, I'm going to uh, give you tithes and offerings and going to give my life to you. And when he woke up, he anointed the rock that he used as a pillow and he said, this is not Mangaweka, this is the house of God. This is the gates of heaven. The name of the place was Luz. And Luz means a place of desperation. A place of tremendous need. When God turns up in a place of need, the place that was desperate and in need becomes the gates of heaven for you. And Jacob said... God is here, but I did not know it. There was an encounter between the God of heaven and a man on earth, but the encounter was not initiated by a man. It was initiated by God. Hallelujah. Moses was at the back blocks of uh, Horeb. When God just turned up, God encountered Moses in the burning bush. Gideon was just threshing wheat where they pressed the wine. And God turned up and said, a mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, Pastor Gary lives down the road. I think you're talking to the wrong man. Here is a defeated man in a defeated culture. And God turned up. He had nothing to do with it. It was God's initiative. And God just turned up and encountered him. And from there, you know the story where we had an army of 32,000 and God whittled down the army to 300 men. And God was able to do more with 300 than 32,000. Are you alright? So God can encounter us supernaturally. On the other hand, we can actually encounter God not initiated by heaven, but initiated by us. When Jacob came back, Jacob encountered by God in Bethel, and then he went to Paddan Aram and served for about 21 years. Seven years for Leah and seven years for Rachel, and, and then he worked for his father-in-law for some six uh, years plus months. And then he left. And he heard that his brother was coming to a... That's what he thought. He interpreted that his brother was coming to kill him. And he wanted to encounter this God that encountered him at Bethel. And now he is at the brook Yabok. And he stayed there, let his family go first. He stayed there trying to find the face of God. And he encountered God. God turned up and he wrestled with God all night. And God said, let me go. It's daylight. And he said, what's your name? God said, what's your name? He said, my name is Jacob. And God said, uh, you're a prince with man and with God. But that, that initiative, that encounter was initiated by Jacob. The Bible says, if you seek for me, you'll find me. If you seek for me with all of your heart. The Bible says in Hebrews 11... Those that come to God must believe that God is and that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, you'll be open. If you ask, it will be given unto you. That's what the Bible says. So it's possible to initiate an encounter with God 
from us. Remember the late, great Derek Prince, great Bible teacher, a very, very, very sharp man, a very highly intellectual, uh, academic uh, man, academician. That's a big word for a Samoan, <laughs> academician. And he was drafted to go into the war. And he was a learned man. He read avidly. And he said, uh, I'm going to the war. I'm going to miss all my books. And then because he's quite sharp himself, he said, if I'm going to the war and I am going to take just one book, what book will I take out of all the books I've got? And he was not a Christian. He was heathen to the bone and out the other side. But he said this to himself. He, he calculated it intellectually. He said, if I'm going to take a book to the war, there's only one. I might as well take the Bible. So he took the Bible with him. And he wanted to read the Bible to find out if the God of the Bible is real. And uh, he was working, uh, he was leading the, the, the folks, uh, uh, he was in the, the folks in the army that, that prepare the meals for those that are in the battle. And they will go find a camp, they set up the kitchen and everything, and they cook meal. The people at the battle come and eat and they fed them. And they used to make fun of him because he'll have a glass of whiskey a smoke in his mouth, swearing like a trooper, and reading the Bible. But he was honest enough, there was integrity in the heart to try to find out what this book is all about. And he was reading it every day, and then he said this, as I read the Bible, I came to an amazing experience that instead of me reading the book, the book was actually reading me. And then he gave his life to the Lord in the barracks of the army. No preacher, no service, just between him and God. But he encountered God by reading the Word of God. In a sense, you can say, that encounter was initiated by him. But he became a great Bible teacher. One of the prophecies he had in the first days of his ministry... Somebody came and prophesied over him. God's going to give you a teaching ministry that will be like a trickle that will turn into a stream. The stream will become a river. The river will become a, a, a sea. The sea will become an ocean. The ocean will become a great sea. Or oh, words to that effect. I'm just recalling this by memory, okay? But he, he, was, uh, he encountered God by initiating something so that he can find God. And God declares, if you seek for me, you'll find me. If you seek for me with all of your heart, God can be found. The great thing is, everybody has the same access to God. Why? Because in a sense, God has already moved. We are 2,000 plus years late. God has already died on the cross. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God in that sense has already moved. If you don't find God, it's not God's fault. Hallelujah. And the book of James said this, If you will draw nigh unto God, God will draw nigh unto you. Now there are many people who are angry at God, but they're stupid. Because they have no idea of what they are doing. And they accuse God of so many things. Like the people say, if God's God, why is the world in a mess? God does not control the world. There's a God of this world. His name is Satan. Don't blame Jesus for what's the world. Jesus is trying to uh, make the world a better place for you to live. Are you okay? Say amen. So have you found Proverbs chapter 2? And I, I'm sharing this because I... I gloss over this last week. I want to share two things this morning. I may not get to the second thing, but we'll share about this. Okay? So, chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if you receive my words, receive. 
If you receive my words, that's what Derek Prince found. He began to receive the word of God and in the reception of the word of God, he saw that the word was reading him. Like a mirror that he was looking into and he realized that his life was not right. The Bible says the word of God is a mirror. It'll help us to behold that mirror so that you can find out what your face looks like. If there's snot on your nose and you look at the mirror, it'll reveal the snot. So what do you do with the snot? You don't use the mirror to wipe the snot away. The mirror only reveals the snot, but you take a hanky and you wipe your nose. The mirror reveals our condition of sinful men. But the mirror can't cleanse the sin out of you. You have to go to the one who redeems us. His power and his blood can cleanse us from all sin. But the word of God reflects our condition. And the Bible says, if you receive my word. How many times do we come to church? How many times have we heard the word? How many times do you read the word? The Bible says, don't just read the word, receive the word. How do you receive the word? James tells us, receive with meekness. When we come to God, we receive the word of God with an attitude of meekness in our heart. The meek inherit the earth. And when you receive the word with meekness, the engrafted word that is able to save our souls, Many of us will hear the word, what was that? Yeah. We receive the word and not receive it. We re reject the word because we think we know better than God. So the stream of the river of God's word is wanting to come into your life. The only problem is you've also got your own river. It's called marshland. The Samoan word is tofusi. So you've got the river that Ezekiel saw and everywhere it went, it went, the life come along, uh, people can fish at the, the side of the river, and everywhere the river went, there's life. But there's a place that the river went to, and it didn't give life. Why? Because there was already muddy water, marshland that was there, and the river could not do anything because somebody's already got their own river. So you got two seas in in the, in the promised land, the, the, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. The other sea is full of life. The same place, it just flows from that sea to that sea. The Dead Sea, everything that goes into the Dead Sea dies. And many people say, well, blame God when they have their own marshland and God is trying to flow His river, but they don't want to empty their marshland so that the river of God can bring life. Are you alright? Not angry, just trying to make a point. But you have to receive the word with meekness. Receiving the engrafted word with an attitude of meekness. You can't receive the word of God with pride. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So the Bible says, if you receive my words... And treasure, treasure, receive and treasure my commandments. What do you treasure? Hallelujah. What do you treasure? Do you treasure your job? Do you treasure your family? What's the treasures that you have in your home? Do you display your treasures? Many times we don't display our treasures. We hide them away for special occasions. Are you okay? You treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to my wisdom. You receive, you treasure, and you incline. I had one, one lady said to my wife, your husband is afraid of me. My wife said, how come? He, she said, he can't look me in the face. He looks everywhere. I want you to know something. In the culture of the Samoans, you never look anybody in their eyeballs. You don't. It's completely rude. So when, when you're talking to somebody, especially if talking to a senior, you never look anybody in the eye. You, you incline your head while you talk. So 
you, you sit there and you go like this and you talk and they talk to you, they tell you what to do, and then you get up and leave. That's inclination. You incline your ear to my saying. And you can't incline your ear without worshiping. You can't incline your ear unless your head is bowed. When you bow your head, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our Maker. And when you receive the Word, when you treasure the Word, when you incline your ear with a spirit of worship, are you ready for the Word? The pastor said, yeah. Are you ready for the Word? That means from then on, you incline your ear. You receive with a worship full attitude hallelujah so that you incline your ear to my wisdom and then it says apply your heart to understanding you don't just incline you apply how many apply the word or how many leave here and the birds of the air come and pick the word out of your heart you incline your ear you worship and then you apply hallelujah are you okay you apply your heart to understanding yes if you cry out for discernment you cry out for this you cry out for wisdom when solomon came to the kingdom he was just a boy and he said to the lord lord i don't know this people is a great people I don't know how to judge your people. I have no wisdom. I have no discernment. Can you give me discernment? Can you give me wisdom so I will know what to do? And God said, you ask for one thing, I'll give you three. You ask for wisdom, I'll give you wisdom, I'll give you honor, I'll give you wealth. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. We ask for one thing. He gave him three things. Before you and after you, nobody's going to be like you. And everybody knew about Solomon when he divided the, the Honda, I mean, sorry, the baby. When he said, uh, which one owns the baby? The woman whose baby died while she was sleeping said, it's my baby. The mother of the baby said, it's my baby. So he said, okay, get a soldier, get a sword. Cut the baby in half and just give the mother half each. The one that owned the baby said, don't do that. Give the baby to her. And Solomon said, that's her baby. Give it to her and the whole nation. Why? Because God answered the prayer. He said, if you ask, I'll give it to you. If you knock, it'll be open. If you seek, you'll find. And the, everybody, not just the nation of Israel, but everybody at the time heard what the God of Abraham did for the king of Israel and what the king was able to do in cutting the baby into and everybody heard whoa that was great how can a Samoan do that a Samoan's that wise <laughs> our Maori's that wise everybody has an equal opportunity to the wisdom of God whether you're colored or not colored and like we said you know if you're white when in the sun you're red, when you're cold you're purple, and then you call me colored. I mean, you're every color of the rainbow when you call me colored. Give me a break. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Are you all right? Amen. He said, if, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, you lift up your voice. Lift your voice. Cry out to God for discernment and lift your voice for understanding. Whose voice? Your voice. Whether it's a woman or man, regardless of what ethnicity you are, whether you're Filipino, Samoan, or European, South African, whatever, if you will lift your voice to God, if you're educated or not, a teacher or a dentist or a doctor regardless of who you, or retired or a housewife or a farmer if you will lift your voice everyone has the same access to God hallelujah 
Lift your voice for understanding. If you seek for her as silver. You seek as silver. If you seek me with all of your heart. You seek for this wisdom. This as silver. You seek her as silver. You seek this fear of the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you okay? This is all right. And search for her as for hidden treasure. When something is hidden, you know it's there, and you search for her. When you're an, an accountant, how many accountants here? No one. And you go through the balance sheet, and there's something missing. It's not balanced. You go search for that transaction. And when you find that transaction, and I used to do that when I used to do stuff, and now I don't even know what they do in the accounting firms. They charge the planet. But I'll, I'll put a, a, a balance sheet, and the thing will not be balanced, and then I'll go back through all the transactions and all the entries, and you debit what comes in, and you credit what goes out. <laughs> Hello? And when you find it, it may be 42 cents. But when you find it, ooh, there's, there's a satisfaction inside that is unequal. It's like the day you gave your life to the Lord. Something happened. Heaven walked into your heart. Heaven now resides in you. Jesus Christ is now your Lord and Savior. And the day you got saved, the problem is you grow up and you forgot the day you got saved. Are you all right? You search for her as for hidden treasure. Hallelujah. You seek a silver and search for her as for hidden treasure. Then, the Bible says, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. You will understand something. It's the fear of the Lord and you will find something, it's the knowledge of God. I'm getting somewhere, I'm just introducing the point. Hallelujah. For the Lord gives wisdom. For the Lord gives wisdom. Everybody say, for the Lord gives wisdom. It's not given by you, it's not given by your teacher, it's given by the Lord. The Lord gives wisdom. There is a natural wisdom, there is a demonic wisdom, and James talks about those two wisdoms. And many of us are fl flooded with demonic wisdom and natural wisdom of the planet. And the Bible says it's demonic, it's earthy, and many times bring division. That's not the wisdom that the Bible talks about. True wisdom is given by the Lord. The Lord gives wisdom. Hallelujah. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk upright. Hallelujah. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk righteously. Hallelujah. But... He stores wisdom for you. He hides the wisdom, godly wisdom for you. He stores it up. You know when you got your favorite son, you got your favorite daughter, everybody gets something, but there's something special for that favorite one. How many are like that? <laughs> Some of you are not honest enough. God is like that. He stores sound wisdom for the upright. He, he sets it aside. Fangangasua. Are you okay? That means, Fangangasua means uh, it's, 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 it's here, it's set apart for somebody. God sets apart godly wisdom for you. And He will not reveal that to the whole world. That's just for His kids. Hallelujah. Are you okay? And says, when, when all this is done, you'll understand the fear of the Lord 
and the knowledge of God. So if you have a look at uh, Isaiah 33, we can start the message for today. All that was an introduction and catching up for some of us that weren't here on Sunday last week. And uh, so we start for the, today. And verse 5, Isaiah 33. The Lord is exalted, for He dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness, wisdom and knowledge. That's just what we talk about. He gives wisdom, you understand, and He gives knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times. What's going to keep you stable in the midst of COVID? What's going to keep you stable when prices are rising? What's going to keep you stable in the midst of the Ukrainian war when everything is going to rise in price? What's going to keep you stable? It says this, wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your time. And the strength of salvation, the strength of your salvation is in wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is His treasure. The fear of God is God's treasure. How do you get that? You get that from Proverbs chapter 2. How do you get the fear of God? Now let me say this, and we said this last week. What is treasure to God who knows all things and who owns all things? If you own everything in the planet, what will be your treasure of all the things you own? This God is the God of heaven and earth. Even though the world is not run by in that sense, that's not our message today. It's the God of this world. They're messing things up. But the God that we serve owns all things. God has not given the earth to the devil. The earth belongs to the Lord. And all the treasures of the earth belongs to Jesus Christ. And then the heavens. The heavens and the earth. God is in heaven and He does whatever He wants. But God will not do anything on earth unless He reveals His will to a prophet. Hallelujah. But what is treasure to God who owns all things? The Bible says, God's treasure is the fear of the Lord. The difficulty I find today is many people, profess Christians, don't understand and don't even fear God. Now, how do you get the fear of God? We saw that in Proverbs chapter 2. If you'll cry out for discernment, if you incline your ear, if you receive my word, you'll understand the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. What is knowledge? The Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that's not just knowledge you get from school. You go to school to get that. And a lot of that is not even true. Don't let me get on to that. Let me stay on course. The Bible says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It has to do with godly knowledge. How do you get godly knowledge? The same way you get godly wisdom. So if you ever look at Proverbs chapter 1. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Knowledge and wisdom come the same way. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of godly knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Comes the same way. But the Bible says, My people, that is God's people, are destroyed because they lack knowledge. How do you get knowledge? Fear of the Lord. And because you reject knowledge, the Bible says, I will reject you from being a priest unto me, and I will reject your children. 
Now, how many children today you find, they, they, they're like vagabonds. They just go everywhere. They don't know where they're going. They have no direction. Why? Because I think they are rejected because their parents don't like the knowledge and the fear of God. They don't want to worship God. They would rather worship rugby and the old blacks than worship the Savior. And so they are rejected, not because God don't love them. God loves the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But we have rejected the fear of God that brings knowledge, and without knowledge we are destroyed. Are you okay? So if you ever look at the same chapter, let me read from verse 24. Now this is God, when we said that God has already moved. Because I have called you and you refused. So God has called but we refuse. I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you disdain all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke. When God rebukes you, it's good. He that, he that heeds a rebuke will be honored. Now that's not even, a, even in our vernacular, even in our vocabulary. The Bible says, if you heed a rebuke, you are going to later on be honored. Many times we rebuke somebody and they go to the police, and then you will find the rebuke of being, hello? Even the parents, when they rebuke the kids, they go to the police. Something is wrong. If you will take the rebuke, you're going to be honored. So let's read on. Because you disdain all my counsel, it will not have none of my rebuke. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. When your terror comes like a, a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you. When you are in loose. Verse 28. They will call on me. But I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. Remember what we said? If you seek for me diligently, if you search for me with all, you'll find me. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a, a reward of those that diligently seek him. If you don't have the fear of God in your heart, you can seek God diligently and not find him. You may be diligent, but if the fear of God is not in your heart, your seeking is in vain. You build a house, but you build it in vain. You build a family, it's built in vain. You watch your family, you watch in vain. Why? There's no fear of God in your heart. And when you seek God diligently, you don't find Him. You're very quiet. What is God's treasure? The fear of God is His treasure. If we will seek and understand the fear of God, You'll have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And when you call, he's going to say, here I am. When you pray, the Bible says, I will listen to you. When you seek for me, you'll find me if you seek for me with all of your heart. But if there's no fear in the heart. Many years ago, we had a, an Australian preacher come and preach here in this pulpit. He was a Kiwi, grew up with uh, John Hart. John Hart? What, who was the, uh, the football coach? John Hart. Grew up with him. In, they were the same classmates. 
So he came here and he preached from this pulpit. One of the young men that uh, he came to church and uh, the same pair of shorts, I think he was running around in the paddocks and he came with a, a singlet and he came up to the front to uh, I think, I don't know who it was. It may have been Chris Alexander who asked some people to come and take up the, the offering. And he came up to the front with his pair of shorts and his singlet. And the guy that came from Australia said, Young man, this is the house of God. Now, I'm not talking about clothing because somebody who's poor may not have anything but that kind of clothes. That boy was not poor. He was quite well off. But we get the idea that we can just do anything in the house of God because God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart, but where do men look? Outside. I can't see your heart. I can only see what's outside. I had a talk with a guy and, and he said, what's wrong with you? What, what are you looking at me like that? I said, no, it's a, I'm fine. He said, no, 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 no. I said, well, you're a public figure. He said, yeah. How come when you come to church, you'll dress so well everywhere else, but when you come to church, you don't? I went to a wedding where you went, and I saw you in a tie and a suit. Now, I'm not saying that everybody should wear a tie and a suit. Please, that's not the point. I'm trying to illustrate the fear of God. And I said, I saw you in a suit, but you never worn anything remotely close to what you wore to the wedding in the church. He said, I, I see what you're saying. And today, there's very little fear of God in many facets and generations of the church. The Bible says, I think it's in Hebrews 12, I didn't look it up uh, during the break, but uh, it says, we have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Hallelujah. You remember that? And the Bible says, we did not come to the mountain that burns with fire, that when Moses saw God on Mount Sinai, even though Moses was used to the presence of God, Moses feared exceedingly. That's not the demonic fear the Bible talks about. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. This is the awe and the honor and the respect that we have for God. Hallelujah. A lot of people say, what about the grace of God? Well, what about the grace of God? See, one of the most amazing things ever written, which is so biblical... And so doctrinally correct is this. It's grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. It's grace. It's grace that teaches the heart to fear. Don't ever separate grace and the fear of God. Grace Grace upon grace, but grace teaches the heart to fear, and grace brings relief from the fear of man and the fear of the world and the fear of the future and the fear of the demonic. Grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relief. How precious did that grace appear! The hour I first believed. You can encounter God. You can encounter God in the car. You can encounter God mowing the lawn. The guy that started a full gospel businessman's fellowship in New Zealand. Not sure if he's still alive or not. He said, uh, I, I encounter God. When I mow the lawn. He has the cleanest lawn in Takapuna. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What's your secret between you and God? My wife encounters God in the shower. She's the cleanest human being I know. 
My nephews come for a holiday, from a school holidays, and they were talking to one another. I said, you know, auntie, she has four showers every day. Four showers. Those boys don't even have a shower every four days, but their auntie has four showers every day. She encounters God when she's having a shower. I encounter God when I eat and when I drive and when I sleep. When I want to hear from God, I either drive, eat, or sleep. If you come to my house and you talk to me and I go to sleep, I'm trying to encounter God. I'm not rude to you. I'm just trying to encounter God, okay? Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But God is available to all of us. But are you willing to receive his word? Is your ear open and inclined to what he's trying to say to you? Hallelujah. Is your voice lifted up to him? Is your heart lifted up to him? If you're here this morning, you never made Christ the Lord of your life. God wants to encounter you. Are you willing for the encounter? Because when God encounters you, everything makes sense. It will be terrible if you come to church and you die, go to hell on roller skates. Talking to an elderly man, I led to the Lord. And he said to me, thank you very much for showing me the way of salvation. I said, praise God. He's dying now. He probably will be gone within a month. But he said, thank you for showing me. Thank you for having the boldness to tell me that even though I was an elder in the church I was in, I've been going to church since I was knee high to a grasshopper. Thank you for having the courage and the boldness to tell me that if I died that day, I'll go to hell on roller skates. Because even though I knew the church, I did not know God. You may come to church, you may know the church, but you may not know God. You say, I've been looking for God. Well, you can find Him if you look for Him with all of your heart. Today, I want to give you an opportunity. If you're here today and you've never made Christ the Lord of your life, or maybe you've made Christ the Lord of your life, but you're not living right. Maybe you're listening to me from home. I want to give your life to Jesus. What a wonderful day to encounter Him because He wants to encounter you. Hallelujah. If that's you, I want you to stand to your feet. Because I want to pray for us. If you're at home, I want you to respond from home. However you want to respond, I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. And if you are saved, but something of what we shared today has ministered to you, and you want to respond to the word of God today, you receive his word, you heed it, then I want you to stand because I want to pray for us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we stand in your presence. We pray. Thank you that you have not left us like orphans on the snow. Not left us without help. We pray, dear God, that even as your word goes out, that it will be received. It will be treasured. Our ears have inclined to your sayings. And our hearts will apply your word unto our lives. We cry out and lift our hearts and seek and search as for hidden treasure. Now, Father, we pray for everyone standing and those that are listening from home. And Lord, that your blessing that makes rich and adds no sorrow will be their portion today and the rest of their days. The fear of God will be the stability of our times. It will stabilize us, Lord God. Father, it will hold us steady. That things will not perturb us, Lord God. Things will not sway us. Because we are founded on wisdom. We understand the knowledge of the Lord. We understand the fear of God. It's your treasure. Help us, Lord God, that the fear of the Lord will be our treasure too. Bless your people today. 
Touch our lives. We give you honor and we give you praise. You're a great God. In Jesus' name. Amen.